to break this word, Jesus. In your name, amen. First thing I always do is I look up the word. 
So the Blue Letter Bible app is what I use. And it says it's a release from bondage or imprisonment. Forgiveness or pardon of sins. A letting them go as if they had never been committed. Freedom, liberty. I made a little definition myself. My definition of that is walking in victory. Walking it. Amen. That's powerful. Amen. Yes. Amen. Jesus called us to this in the Gospels. He also practiced deliverance. In Luke 4, 18 through 19, this is the King James Version, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In this passage, we find Jesus quoting from the book of Isaiah in the synagogue. So in this, this portion, Jesus is in the synagogue, and they ask him to read. And so he picks this particular scroll or this particular book because he wants to point this out for them. Okay? And this is what he reads. So in Luke 4 and 21, he says, And he began to say unto them, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. The Lord was telling them, I'm here to set the captive free. I'm here to liberate, to give you deliverance. Well, in this verse, he's speaking to the saved people in the synagogue, the church people. This made them angry. It states in verse 28, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They were so enraged that it states in 29 that they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. So they were ready to throw Jesus off the top of the hill of the city. But it says that Jesus just walks right past them and he steps into his ministry. So as you continue to read that chapter, he goes about teaching, preaching, and along the way, he's casting out unclean spirits from some, he's healing others, he's uh, healing all kinds of diseases and ailments, making people whole. So why did the people that he came to deliver reject him? Because if they accepted him, they would have to accept the fact that they were living in bondage. They didn't believe that they were living in bondage or captivity. They came out of captivity when Moses brought them out of Egypt and so many other times after that, right? How could they be captive? They knew the law. They knew all the prayers. They got the Sabbath. The same goes for the world today. There are people in the church that reject full deliverance of what Jesus speaks. They go to church. They pray. They fast. They read the word. They preach Bible study, teach Bible studies. They're preaching to their co-workers. We're okay. Right? How could this be? Well, let's take a look at the Israelites. They were liberated the moment that they made it through the, the sea. The Lord parted the waters and they walked right through. Now this, uh, how, how my dad talks about types and shadows of things. This was a type of baptism for the Israelites. They walked right through the water. Then it says that the Lord had a pillar of fire that would guide them along their way by night and a pillar of clouds that would... Uh, um, guide them by the day, okay? Because they were in the desert. And, and what's our guide? The Holy Spirit. That was a type of Holy Spirit for them, okay? So they had something that guided them. But yet they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness, walking around a huge circle for years in the same cycle, not entering the, the promised land. Why? They were set free. Well, there was one thing that they had not allowed. They did not allow themselves to be liberated in their minds. Yeah. Yes. They held themselves captive to the old ways. Yeah. They were still operating in the works of the flesh. Yeah. They had a victim mentality. Yeah. Yeah. So this meant that until they would allow themselves to accept the deliverance that the Lord already gave, they would remain in bondage. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Wow. When they made it to the promised land, it was time to walk in. God said, go. It's time. It's there. Land flowing with milk and honey. Everything you need, it's there. So then the Bible says that 12 spies were sent out, one from each of the 12 tribes. 
They were dispatched by Moses to scout out the land, this land of Canaan. It says that ten men came back, saying that the land was already inhabited. They could only see failure. They're too big. It's too hard. We're not capable. Okay. They saw that they would be defeated on their own strength. You see, when you try to fight your battles without God, you always only see failure. But there were two men, Caleb and Joshua, who came back saying, yes, let's go. God has given us the land. We got this. Caleb knew that they could take the land and defeat the giants. Why? Because he was walking in complete deliverance. He was seeing according to the spirit. He was seeing with the spiritual eyes. He knew that the battle was the Lord's. When David fought the giant, he knew that the battle was the Lord's. He said, who are you to defy the armies of the living God? He didn't even put himself in it. Come on. That's good. Thank you, Jesus. One of the biggest controversies in the church today is the topic of deliverance mm -hmm. and an erroneous thought of what it is. You see, there are arguments about whether a Christian can have a demon. Can we be possessed or oppressed? You see, my friends, Jesus revealed to me that we're asking all the wrong questions. Mm -hmm. Is there a spiritual realm? Absolutely. Are there demons? Yes. Did Jesus cast them out? Of course. We see that all throughout the Gospels. But he never gave them a platform. He just spoke in authority and told them to leave, and they obeyed. Jesus didn't go around looking for all the demons to cast them out. Come on. When someone appeared in his path, they had a need, and he met the need. He made those people whole, not only in body, but also in their minds and in their hearts. So the focus is on Jesus and his authority. Come on. Yes. Brothers and sisters, if you and I are filled with the same spirit that Jesus had, why then are we not living a life of victory? Right. Yeah. The conclusion is that we are choosing to live in bondage. Come on. Come on. You see, when you choose not to be changed in your mind and your heart, you choose to be in bondage. So how do we live the life of victory and not captivity? The key is found in your word. Amen. Romans chapter 8, 1 through 4. This is the Amplified Classic. Okay? I think Uncle Corey has it up there. I'm going to read it from up there. It's a little bigger. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation, no judging guilty of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. So what's our first key? We have to walk in the spirit. You can't walk after the flesh. A lot of times we want to use the cop out, the devil made me do it. And these guys going around casting out demons from people. You're okay. You just went out and drank all week, but let me cast out the demon of alcoholism. You have to take some fault in that. You chose to take the drink. You're not walking according to the spirit. You're walking according to the spirit. Amen. So now we're glorifying Satan and making him, and he's like, yeah, I'll take fault. Heck yeah. Yeah. I want a platform. I want to come here. Come on. Let's, Let's keep going. Verse 2, it says, for the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, so you're new, it has freed me from the law of sin and of death. So when you choose to walk in the spirit, you're free from the law of sin and death. When you choose to walk according to the flesh, even though you've already been free, you're choosing the law. Come on. I'm, right now I'm walking in the spirit, so I'm stepping out of grace. I no longer choose grace. I no longer choose the blood of Jesus Christ because I want to walk according to what I want to walk according to. I want to do the things that please my flesh. So you're choosing that. Uh, next verse says, For God has done what the law could not do, its power being weakened by the flesh, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit, sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. God condemned sin in the flesh, subdued, overcame, deprived it of its power over all who accept that sacrifice. Do you accept the sacrifice so that he can subdue it, overcome it, deprive it of his power. Yeah, come on. He does it. Yeah, right. um, 
This is another, verse 4. It says, So that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who live and move not in the ways of the flesh, but in the ways of the Spirit. Our lives governed not by the standards and according to the dictates of the flesh, but controlled by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what is the first thing we must do? Be in Christ Jesus. So it all began with repentance. Julie spoke on that. And then salvation. Eric spoke on that. Once I followed that path, now I must live and walk after the Spirit of God. That means my life must change. This doesn't always happen overnight. There's a process as you grow in relationship with him. He begins begins to change you from the inside out. We must be an open book for the Lord to read. We must be vulnerable with him. We must ask him to change us, to help us walk in it as new creatures. This is how the Israelites got stuck. They came through the Red Sea with all their baggage, their old mindsets, just like we do in the beginning when we come to God. Then as the Lord began to do a new thing, they couldn't let go of the comforts of Egypt, of their bondage, because it was too hard. Walking in the desert is hot. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> They're unsure of the next step. I can't see what's next. i got to put in effort. You mean i got to wake up and pray? Come on, girl. i got to open the Bible? Yes. Can't you just change it, God? Can't you just fix it? It's too hard. That's, that's Basically, that's what they were doing. They even said, back in bondage, back in Egypt, we did our same old job. Yeah, we got whipped and we got spit on. We got yelled at, called outside of our names. But at least we got to eat and sleep in the comforts of our own homes or what they believed to be their own homes. This is some of us. After we get washed in the blood, are we willing to give our old mindsets to God? Throughout our lives, there are instances that occur that allows the enemy to build strongholds in our minds and in our hearts. Yes. Those things can become the very thing that keeps us in bondage. Yes. The reason for this is, becomes, is because in situations that come up, if we decide to operate or react out of that stronghold, we are not allowing God to fight our battles. Mm-hmm. What does that even mean? Operate out of your stronghold. Let me give you an example. Let's take the stronghold of rejection. This is one that is most common. This can begin in childhood. When your parents spoke to you, spoke words to you like, you're not good enough. Why can't you be like, insert better person here? Or even if your parent abandoned you at a young age. It may have even begun in the womb when your mom found out she was pregnant and spoke that you were an accident. Or may have even wanted to abort you. Or what about the couple that had all girls and wanted a boy so bad that you came out a girl? This was an open door to the enemy. To mess with your mind and camp out within to build a stronghold. Doesn't seem fair, does it? Well, guess what? The enemy doesn't play fair. So let's look at this person with the stronghold of rejection. They begin to grow. And every time another disappointment comes about in life, they attribute that thing happening to the rejection. They end up in a place of being very lonely. Become a loner. They know that no one will ever love them. They have always been rejected. Why continue to try? When someone wants to reach out and help them, they look through the lens of rejection. They don't see it as help. They see it as, I'm not good enough again. When the person responds to rejection or looks through the eyes of rejection, I'm sorry. They can't accept love because they feel unloved. So they can't even accept the love of the Father at times. This was the exact intention, to make you stay at arm's length from Jesus. Fear of rejection holds you back from going deeper in him. Let's look at another one. Let's look at mine. For many years, I had a stronghold of control. Now, the controlling spirit, this is a generational thing in my family. It comes from both sides of my family, my mother's side and my father's side. 
The women are very strong and controlling. This makes it difficult to submit to authority. Now, some of the women have cut this line, this generational curse. My mom was always an amazing example of submission. A lot of times I would be like, man, you do submissive. That's crazy. <laughs> but she always gave me this awesome example of that. She cut that. So how did it become a stronghold in me? Well, it came in as a child when I was molested. That's another story for another time. But I was molested as a child for many years. And that was a knocking on the door, allowed the enemy to come in. And I determined within myself that I would never let anyone hurt me again. So I would control everyone and everything. They'll do things my way or the highway. I was told I could do anything that I put my mind to. That fed my stronghold. So I would look at any situation, I would figure it out, and I would fix it. The attention that the enemy had behind this is that I didn't need God. He didn't save me when I was a child and being hurt. Why would he help me now? Monica, you can only depend on yourself. So when I was delivered from this mindset, the Lord had to allow things to happen in my life that no one could fix, not even me. When my marriage was on the rocks at the point of divorce multiple times, the only one I could turn to was Jesus Christ. When my baby girl was born premature and in the in incubator for months, the only one who in could intervene was Jesus. When my son was so sick that he was to a point that he could not walk and Children's Hospital kept sending me home because they didn't know what was wrong with him, I had to say Jesus. You see, I had to get to the place where I determined within myself that I wanted to change. I had to pray the prayer. Lord, change me. Yeah. But it couldn't be just a statement. I had to meet. When you pray, Lord, change me, you are giving him permission to break down those strongholds. Yes. Then when the, the deliverer comes and begins to break down the strongholds in your mind, you must continue with the follow through. Just because Jesus has delivered me from the stronghold of control, it doesn't mean that it goes away. You see, the devil will always come and knock at the door with the same thing that he knew was your weakness. So when he comes knocking or a situation arises, I then have a choice. How will I respond? Will I respond out of the stronghold in this instance or will I give it to the deliverer? How will I do that? Well, I must allow the fruits of the spirit to be my response. When I want to respond in anger, I choose to respond with the fruit of love. When I want it to be fixed now, I choose to respond with the fruit of patience. You see, the Israelites had a stronghold. They had a victim mentality. They had a right to be angry because what happened to them was not right. You have a right. You do. Somebody hurt you. You were hurt. You do have a right. But here's the thing. But what they needed to do was surrender their right to be angry and hurt. Amen. Amen. The Lord was waiting for them to say, we are free and we will walk in life. Yes, we were beaten and bruised in Egypt. We were treated wrongly and we did nothing to deserve it. Lord, but nothing catches you by surprise, so I release the debt today. Amen. One of the ways that these strongholds rises back up in us is we, when we allow open doors to the enemy in our lives. Yeah. Open doors can be things like unbelief, fear, envy, ignorance to God's word, not reading your word, mm -hmm. deception of the enemy, and a big one, unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. Amen. You open doors by allowing those things to affect you and bring you back to your old carnal mindset yeah. that will cause a fleshly response. Mm -hmm. When you don't forgive, you stay in the hand of God. You choose to walk in bondage. When you give in to fear, you no longer what he, have what he said was a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. But you have it inside of you, his spirit. He has given you authority. We walk around with this mentality that if only God will change my situation, or if he will change my husband, change my children, change my job, change my car, change my house, change my church, change my pastor. Better yet, Lord, change everyone and everything around me. Then things will be better. Me, 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 me. Here's the thing. 
like my brother said, it's not our job to fix anybody. Amen. And you may not be able to change your situation, but the one thing that you can change is yourself. Amen. That's what it means to have deliverance. Amen. It's walking in his victory. When you allow him to reveal to you these things that have tried to lay claim on your mind and heart, you make way for the healing. So that is so much needed. He gave us the keys in his word. How do we deal with strongholds, old carnal mindsets? Well, the answer is in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. It says, for though we walk, live in the flesh, we are not carrying out warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. So you're not fighting against flesh and blood. You're bringing every thought and every imagination into captivity. So when that thing jumps in your mind, right away you say, no, you're a liar. Yeah. That's a lie, and I refute it, yeah. and I, I bring truth to that lie. Yes. I bring this into obedience to the captivity of Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. When the Lord showed me deliverance, oh, when the Lord showed deliverance to those in the Bible, we saw evident change in them. Let's take a look at a couple stories here. Mark 5, 15. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind. The very man who had the legion. This was the one that he took out uh, the legion uh, of demons from. Okay? So the people began to hear that Jesus was healing and delivering many. They began to believe in their minds that they could be delivered because they they, they see in these instances. This guy was crazy. He had a legion of demons. He would do all this stuff. He was scary. Nobody could deal with him. And Jesus came and was like, get out of here. And the man was clothed and in his right room. He was made home. And that increased their faith. That's what, that's what he was doing. He was trying to give revelation of who he was. Okay? They began to believe it in their minds that they could be delivered. We see in many instances that the Lord says that your faith has made you whole. Mark 5 and 34 said, and he said unto her, daughter, that faith had made, uh, hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Then in Luke 17 and 19, another instance when he heals someone, when the one leper comes back after he healed 10 of them, only one knew that there were still parts of him missing that needed to be changed. So he went back to Jesus. And this is what happens. He said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. So he heals ten of them. Okay? Nightly, the one's like, Well, I don't got an arm, I got half a foot, my nose is gone. He healed me, uh, he could replace those things. Think of that. That's in the natural. Think that in the spiritual. There are things that the enemy stole from you. Yes. Will you be made whole or will you just be okay because you're saved? You have to go back to him. Okay, God, I'm ready for you to make me whole, even though it hurts. In Mark 10 and 52, we see blind Bartimaeus. He cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. You see, we can fool the whole world, but God knows what's in our hearts. Amen. Amen. He desires to be the deliverer. So that once you are made whole, you can go forward and fulfill the mandate that he spoke in Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. Now this is the NIV. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness from the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. The ministry of Jesus does involve casting out demons. That just comes along with the ter territory. 
But let's look at what the Lord said in Luke chapter, or, uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. This was after he sent out 72 disciples to do the work um, in verses 17 and 18. Okay, He says, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Yes, yes, yes. So that's huge. Yes. He says, yes, you have authority and nothing will harm you. But the thing that matters most is that your name is written in heaven. So our goal is what it has always been. We lead people to Jesus Christ. Amen. We lead people to salvation. But once you've gotten your salvation, you must allow Jesus to reveal himself as the Lord. I can't do that for you. Because the next step in the process is deliverance. So to answer the question, can the Holy Ghost Christian have a demon? I don't know. And frankly, I don't care. But what I do know is that we have the Spirit of God living in us. Yes. And the Word says, greater is He that is in me than He that is living in the world. Yes. But it's a choice. Yes. I have to walk and make a choice every day to close every door to the enemy yes. and allow myself out of bondage. Yes. We must allow ourselves to be changed more like His image and likeness every day. Yes. We've taken that statement and put it into the category of how we look, but it's so much deeper than that. Yes. So much deeper. Did you know that God desires deeper? Yes. He really desires deeper. You know, we, we have this mindset of, what's your calling for me? Which is great. He does have a calling for you. I want the calling. I want to walk in the calling. And God's like, I just want you to love me. I just want to know you more. I just want to heal you from all those hurts. Yes, I'm going to use you as a preacher. But we got a long way to go before we get there. If I let you go into it now, you're going to fail because you're doing it on your own strength. I desire deeper with you. It's not my desire to be like, oh, yes, Pastor Dave. No. Dave came to me and said, I love you, God. I want to know you more. I love you, God. I want to know you more. I love you, God. Go deep. Go deep, God. And once he got to that place, the Lord said, okay, Dave, you're ready. I'm going to use you in something else. We must allow ourselves to be changed. I remember one Independence Day, I was up early, and I was in prayer, and the Lord dropped this in my spirit. He said, so many proclaim this day as a day of freedom, yet they walk around bound as captives. They are captive to their own ways and their old mentalities. So today, let's be determined to close every door of the enemy. Yes. Let them go to those deep places in our hearts that may have sprung up from childhood. Yeah. Allow them to heal those places. Will you be made whole? Will you allow Jesus to be the deliverer today? You guys can stand with me. God, God dropped this into my spirit this week. He said, the deeper you go in God, the deeper he will go into you. That means when you choose a deeper relationship with him, he will search the deep places of your hearts and your minds. If we remain surface level with Jesus, he will stay surface level with us. Not because he wants to. Because we have a choice. We have free will. So will you choose your free will to keep the hurts? Will you choose your free will to keep the offenses? Will you choose your free will to keep those deep wounds? The ones that nobody knows about, only Jesus knows. The ones that when you're trying to go deeper into prayer, they come into your mind. Will you keep those? Because you have free will. And in that, remain living in captivity. Or will you ask him to expose the root of where these things that you're doing or feelings are coming from? We have to let God deal with the root. For you to grow and walk in victory and have true deliverance, we must allow the Lord to search us and make us like him. Yes. Pornography.
Geography is not the root. There's a root. Something led you to that point. Fantasizing about someone else's husband is not the root. It came from somewhere. Depression, suicide, cutting, anger, rage, violence, alcoholism, these are not the root. Where did it begin? Where did it start, Lord? Why am I dealing with these emotions in my life? When you choose to go farther in God, it gets harder. It does. But that's because you're on the brink. I guarantee you, if you grab a hold of what God is speaking to you today, your week is going to get a little harder. But when you come up against opposition, that means that you're fighting something. And you're going to get through it. And when you get through it, you'll get to the other side. And on the other side, it's so sweet. It's so sweet. Yeah. Okay. 